اطلب العلم اخي فهو درب به نور به ترقى به تحيا عالما حرا فخور اطلب العلم اخي فهو درب به نور به ترقى به تحيا عالما حرا فخور اطلب العلم اخي فهو درب به نور به ترقى به تحيا عالما حرا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد This is our 14th class and the elucidations of Al-Usul Al-Thalatha. We finished our four introductory fundamental principles. The first one was knowledge, knowledge in Allah, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the book. Then number two was to act on it. Number three was to convey it. Number four was to be patient upon that. The proof for the four fundamental principles was Surat Al-Asr. In fact, these four principles are taken directly out of Surat Al-Asr. Finally, in conclusion to the first four fundamental principles, and with this we'll conclude the first chapter, inshallah ta'ala, the author substantiates the proof with a chapter from Al-Bukhari, a chapter title actually from Al-Bukhari. قال البخاري رحمه الله تعالى he says وقال البخاري رحمه الله تعالى باب العلم قبل القول والعمل والدليل قوله تعالى فاعلم أنه لا إله إلا الله واستغفر لذنبك فبدأ بالعلم قبل القول والعمل he quotes البخاري he quotes a title in البخاري a chapter where the title is in البخاري uh, may Allah have mercy upon him. He said, chapter knowledge precedes speech and action. And the proof is the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Most High. No, fa'alam annahu la ilaha illallah. That there is none who has the right to be worshipped but Allah. And ask forgiveness from your Lord for your sins. A verse of Surah Muhammad. Then, then, this is part of the title still. So he began by mentioning knowledge and uh, so he began by mentioning knowledge before speech and action. That's the end of the title. That's the title. Last week we mentioned that there was minor discrepancy in the author quoting uh, a quote attributed to a Shafi'i. And we said it's possible that the author mentioned it by meaning. Here, in quoting Al Bukhari, there's two slight variations in that quote. Uh, when you return and go look in the original Bukhari, you're going to find two slight variations. It's really very minor, but it's something worth noting for Talabat al ilm The author says, وَالدَّلِيلُ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى وَالدَّلِيلُ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى If you go look in Bukhari, it says, لِقَوْلِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى Both mean the same thing, but slight variations. The second variation is in the final last two words where uh, uh, Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab added the last two words. The quote is, so he began with mentioning knowledge before speech and action. The words that were added is before speech and action. That doesn't change the meaning, actually clarifies the meaning, but that's not exactly how it is in the title of Al-Bukhari. In Arabic, فَبَدَأَ بِالْعِلْمِ قَبْلَ الْقَوْلِ وَالْعَمَلِ فَبَدَأَ بِالْعِلْمِ That right there is the where Bukhari stops right there and continues on to something else. قَبْلَ الْقَوْلِ وَالْعَمَلِ is the addition over here. Now why did he do that? Why did he add that? Why is there these variations? Uh, he may have uh, quoted by meaning or he wanted to explain a little bit more because those explain a little bit more. Uh, some say he had, uh, he maybe had a version of uh, Bukhari where the titles, not the hadith, the titles may, may have been worded slightly different. Okay, the next issue. 
The next issue should be who is Al-Bukhari. Since we talked about Al-Bukhari, we should give a little glimpse about his life. But since there's a lecture I gave many, many years ago, uh, I'll refer you to that to listen to it and see the life of Al-Bukhari rahimahullah. Uh, uh, that's what we'll do uh, uh, frequently. Whenever we talk about something, we'll, and we're going to mention it, it's, it's, it's to be mentioned again, we'll refer to it where we mentioned it at. So to cover uh, more knowledge in less time. The next point is, why did the author use a ch chapter title from Al-Bukhari to substantiate a point? Why did he use a title to back up the proof? The compilation of Bukhari, rahimahullah, is worthy of being written in ink of gold. We all know that. It's a compilation whose chains are like the star, the people in the chain are like the stars in the sky. The compilation that has honored, uh, th that compilation has been honored by Ijma in both its merit and ranking. It's a compilation that exterminated evil and those accused of evil. It's a book that affirmed justice and those who are just. That's not all. If you look at the organization and structure of the book, the delicate title and, and how he organized it, there's even more information to get out of that. It's not unusual. It's not unusual for you to read in books of ulama. They want to talk about something and then they're going to back it up, say, Qala al-Bukhari, al-Bukhari named his uh, chapter this and that, to back up a point that they're trying to make. The mere title itself. So imagine if you go to the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Let me give you uh, example which will make you understand it better. What, a student of knowledge once did a report on uh, whether it's better to make multiple Umrahs in one visit or just to stick with one Umrah. For example, you go from here to Mecca in Umrah and you go to Mecca. Once you get to Mecca, you go to a Tan'im a second time like many people do. Third time, you make a fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh, you know, numerous Umrahs. Or is it better to stick to one Umrah? That's a fiqh issue deeply discussed and disputed among the ulama, even some of the four ulama. The student of ilm went and studied and analyzed and looked at the proof and he was telling his friend, the conclusion I came with is the reward is based on what you exert of effort. So his friend told him, that's exactly the title of a chapter in Bukhari's book. Babu ajr al-umrah ala qadar in nasab and now sub means tired, how, how, uh, what, what effort you exert. So you get reward based on your effort. So the man said, well, life I seen that, it would have saved me a lot of time. Just the title itself. He may have even looked in Bukhari, but what happens is a lot of times you're trying to search, you overlook the title, you want to go right into the center. The ulama wrote books, books on the titles Bukhari, rahimahullah, used for his chapters. Uh, you'll see some of that in, if you have, uh, which you all do, inshallah, you have uh, uh, Ibn Hajar's elucidation. He mentions that in his elucidation. Waliullah Dahlawi and Ibn Hamama wrote booklets or books on the titles Ibn Bukhari rahimahullah chose. Some scholars went back and forth writing, did Bukhari mean fiqh opinions when he chose the titles or were they merely just titles that he gave? That go, they go on back and forth and that. These were giants that if, if their titles were, were give so much knowledge, then imagine the books that they wrote. This, this didn't happen by mere knowledge alone. There were secrets between these giants and Allah that elevated them to such high ranks. Brothers tell me when I get a laptop, inshallah, they want to download some program that has 6,000 volumes. A little program that you can download 6,000 volumes. Uh, not volumes, 6,000 titles of Islamic books and four to five times as much as that in volumes. So it's probably like 20,000 or so volumes. 6,000 volumes at the tip of your fingers. When Bukhari, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, ibn Ma'in, and ibn Hanbal, and Nawawi, and ibn Taymiyyah, ibn Qayyim, they needed a hadith. Some at times travel the continent to get a hadith. Now we got 6,000 volumes at your fingertips. With all that knowledge, why didn't no talabat al-ilm of today or ulama produce what that which is close to any one of those giants that we mentioned produce? You read, you read the works 
of uh, the ulama like Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim and Ibn Bukhari in their likes, in their categories, in both quantity and quality and you get astonished. These were men who traveled by donkeys and camels, not by airplanes and cars. These were men who were in and out of prisons and throughout their life was full of struggles. They weren't walking around with laptops in uh, seven star hotels. They were, they were, they were uh, men who a lot of the times wrote from the top of their mind, not by going into books or running through laptop. Why so much? Why so much barakah? Yes, knowledge is essential, but you have to keep secrets between you and Allah that only you and Allah know to elevate you to such high level. I believe they had such secrets that their own wise and closest of, of all students didn't know of. So here, the verse in Bukhari, the Bukhari uses, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ فَعْلَمْ Know that there's none that have the right to be worshipped except Allah. And ask forgiveness from Allah for your sins. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ فَعْلَمْ Knowledge precedes action and saying. And it's a condition for your action and your saying to be accepted. Because knowledge perfects and corrects the intention and the method you conduct your acts and saying. Al-Bukhari rahimahullah uses the ayah for proof on that. The actions must be before, uh, knowledge must be before actions. And when we say actions, we mean heart actions, we mean tongue actions as well, and body part actions. This is proof that a Muslim must start with knowledge before he goes on to saying or acting. And from an intellectual point of view, uh, uh, knowledge must precede your actions because your because how would you know how to perform them common sense how would you know how to perform them if you don't have the knowledge likewise take it from your boss your father your uh, 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 employer your teacher you want to please them how do you please them you got to learn how to please them before you please them because you may do something that may anger them. So knowledge comes before action. That's common sense. Yes, there's some things which come through in an nature by the fitrah. The knowledge of one, oneness of Allah, tawheed, that comes through fitrah. That's why one is created on the fitrah. It's ingrained in man's nature, just like your blood in your flesh. You don't take your newborn and when he's about to talk or he learns to talk, you say shahada to enter Islam. He's, you teach him shahada. However, he's already Muslim because it's ingrained in him. How, one thing you got to take into consideration is even matters with the fitrah, you got to still learn them. Because as time goes by, there's external evil forces surrounding one that taint even matters of fitrah. So that's why you got to learn it even those matters that are within what we know are fitrah. La ilaha illallah. Fa'alam annahu la ilaha illallah. When one masters la ilaha illallah, there's the knowledge of la ilaha illallah, he will not be harmed by any knowledge he missed out on. And whoever's ignorant, and whoever's ignorant of la ilaha illallah, there's no knowledge he can ascertain that will be of any benefit to him. We're talking on a larger scale, the scale of the life after. This is the word that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in Sunan Al-Tirmidhi, uh, in Sunan Al-Tirmidhi on authority of Abu Huraira, وَكَانَ يَقُولُ مَنْ قَالَهَا فِي مَرَضِهِ ثُمَّ مَاتْ لَمْ تُطْعِمْهُ النَّارِ Whoever says it in his illness, a death illness, the hell fire will not touch him. We spend so much time learning it because according to some of the Mufassireen, one of the reasons is that's the verse that's the word that Allah put a parable in the Quran that's like a goodly tree whose root is firm and fixed in the earth and its branches are in the sky its roots is la ilaha illallah the root of that tree is la ilaha illallah in your heart how deep la ilaha illallah is in your heart the tree is la ilaha illallah the branches are your deeds going up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا كَلِمَةً طَيِّبَةً كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ أَصْلُهَا ثَابِتٌ 
وَفَرْعُهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ Okay, the final point on this is more like of a usul fiqh issue. The speech in this verse is directed to the Prophet ﷺ. فَعْلَمْ Learn. To the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Does this include us, me and you? In this verse, most definitely includes all of us. The Prophet ﷺ and we behind him are included. But there's other verses like, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِي يَا أَيُّهَا الرَّسُولِ O you Prophet, O you Messenger, do they include us as well? According to the majority of the Usul Fiqh scholars, it doesn't include us unless there's proof to tag us on. However, according to Abu Hanifa and Ahmad and Imam al Haramain and al Sam'ani, that those verses directed to the Prophet ﷺ include us unless there's proof to exclude us. And it's somewhat the second meaning, uh, maybe a little bit stronger, because if you look in the Quran, where in Surah Al Talaq, Ya ayyuha al Nabiyu, Ida Talaqtum. النِّسَاءِ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيُّ إِذَا طَلَّقْتُمْ النِّسَاءِ Oh you messenger, if you divorce women, it starts talking to the, addressing the Prophet ﷺ, but if إِذَا طَلَّقْتُمْ النِّسَاءِ The second word right after that addresses the whole ummah. Even right after that, يَا أَيُّهَا تَحْرِيمُ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيُّ لِمَا تُحَرِّمُ مَا أَحَلَّ اللَّهُ لَكَ The verse addresses the Prophet ﷺ, but right after that, قَدْ فَرَضَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Then it goes on from addressing to the Prophet ﷺ to addressing the Ummah. So they said that means that it's directed to the Prophet ﷺ in honor to him, of course, and the Ummah behind him. Those are two opinions of usul uh, that uh, stem from words like يَا فَعْلَمْ directed to the Prophet ﷺ or يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيُّ يَا أَيُّهَا الرَّسُولُ With this, we just concluded chapter 1 of Al-Usul Al-Thalatha. We just concluded chapter one of Al-Usul Al-Thalatha. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. That's a true blessing. Before we start on chapter two, I want to give a little, a few moments on the structure of the book, which I should have gave before I started, but I wanted to delay it because I think you'll comprehend it more right now. We just took the four fundamental principles. Introductory, as you know, I always say that four introductory fundamental principles. And the proof on them is Surah Al-Asr and the statement of Al-Bukhari. We took it in approximately 13 classes and a quarter of this class, so, so somewhat of a quarter of this class. So we finished the first four fundamental principles. And according to some ulama, this was not part of the book the author intended. This was his works, but an independent book. One of his students came and tagged it alone. And that is the opinion of Abdurrahman ibn Muhammad ibn Qasim. So they said the first fundamental principle is an independent booklet he wrote. One of his students came and said, why don't I put it in Al-Usul Al-Thalatha as an introduction to the rest of the book. Now Abdurrahman ibn Muhammad ibn Qasim, you may not be familiar with that name. He died in 1972, but he in a way is a reviver. He's a man that compiled the fatawa of Ibn Taymiyyah today. For all the centuries since the death of Ibn Taymiyyah, those fatawa were not compiled until this man in the 60s compiled them. He went all over the world. First he started in the Arabian Peninsula, looked around for any booklets, any fatawa, any statements by Ibn Taymiyyah, written by Ibn Taymiyyah. He began to gather them. Then he traveled to Egypt to try to get any of Fatawa ibn Taymiyyah and compile them and gather them and put them together. The first visit to Egypt, he didn't get nothing out of it. He went a second time. He did actually in a second time compile some more of the uh, uh, writing of Ibn Taymiyyah. Then he took his son Muhammad because as he grew older, he, got, he, he became very ill. He took his son Muhammad to Lebanon. And when he got to Lebanon, he wasn't able to make it, but he sent his son to nearby Asham. May Allah grant them uh, and hasten their victory. Uh, when he went to Asham, his son went to Asham, he came back with 850 pages handwritten by Ibn Taymiyyah that weren't published before because, of, because Ibn Taymiyyah spent a great portion of his life there. Then they went to Paris and they found 13 masail written by Ibn Taymiyyah they did not find in their journey throughout the Arabic countries in Paris. And then he went to Baghdad and found more. And among that which he found uh, in Baghdad is al risala Tadmuriya, a very important work. And maybe in the future, if Allah grants us time in life, we'll study that. So he went all around the world and gathered and compiled it in the 37 volumes you see today, Al-Fatawa. 
Amongst the students are Abdullah ibn Jibreel, Hamoud al-Uqla, Abdullah ibn, uh, Abdullah ibn Frayyan. The, the, actually, Hamoud ibn Uqla, which you all know, he is his adopted son. Uqla, Sheikh Hamoud al-Uqla, was kicked out of his house when he was a 13-year-old kid. And this man adopted him and taught him and sent him to Shiuch, and he became Sheikh Hamoud al-Uqla, one of the great Imams of our time. al Frayyan which was the man, all these are dead. Rahmatullah Ali Majreen. Frayyan is the one who opened Quran halaqat all throughout, organized halaqat all throughout the Arabian Peninsula. Rahmatullah Ali, he was a, one of my teachers and my father's teacher. This man, Ibn Qasim, one of his compilation, in addition to the fatawa, is he compiled a durar al sunniyah 16 volumes uh, uh, of ulama najd and their, their writings and their works. Ibn Qasim is considered among the imams of the da'wah of najd. And he has a small booklet on the elucidations of Al Usul al Thalatha. It's called Al Hashiyah. It's approximately 100 or so pages. And the chapter we started on today, he considers that not to be part of Al Usul al Thalatha. It's part of the author's work, but it's an independent work. And that's really what I lean to, and I think that that's more correct. However, and actually I was adamant about it and that's why I mention it in sort of hesitation because Sheikh Ali Al-Khudair, may Allah hasten his release in prison, adopted the opinion that no, this was part of the original work that uh, the author here wanted this as an introduction to Al-Usul Al-Thalatha. And these are masters. These are masters who mastered the work of the author here. They, they really mastered it and they know the details and depth and not just him, him and his students for two and three generations after him. We have, we have uh, authors who uh, 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 study these matters in depth and detail. And why they do it is that these, these details help us study and analyze and map out and envision in your mind how the book is structured. That way, you can understand more what the book is trying to tell you instead of your mind being shattered all over. It's also beneficial knowledge to know this about the book because it's a book that we spent so much time learning and studying. And it's something that if not mentioned, especially in the English study, over time it might be forgotten. Uh, you see those who spend meaningless life analyzing the works of, for example, Edgar Allan Poe or Shakespeare. They analyze it and spend a lifetime studying it. They study in so much detail that if you were to give them a few pages and tell them, did Shakespeare write this? They'll look at it for a few moments and tell you, no way this could have been his work because this word was not like this. He would have used this word instead of this word. And as Muslims, we have like this man, Ibn Qasim and Ali al-Khudair and Nasr al-Fat, may Allah hasten their release and may Allah have mercy on those who were dead of them, uh, took on the noble cause of studying the works of Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim, Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab and his followers of Najd. Among those who really mastered that detailed work is uh, Sheikh Nasr al-Fahd. Actually, not only does he master it in details, but he memorizes nearly all the works of this author and his students and those who followed along with him in the past uh, centuries. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, he can draw you, you know, sometimes there may be things that you may think they're contradictory. You read it here, then you go to another book, you read it here, and you say, how did this happen? Or sometimes you read something in the book and they did something different. And you got to come with the conclusion, what, what's going on here? How did this happen? Or some of the details that we mentioned about Surah Al-Asr or uh, like that about the statement of Al-Bukhari. Th that takes years and years of analyzing and study to come up with conclusions on that. And amongst those who mastered that is Sheikh Nasr al You can see some of that in his book on the Uthman, Uthman Khilafah. So we don't veer off topic. topic. Uh, what I wanted to mention is that some of this is considered an introduction that some of his students added to Al-Usul Al-Thalatha. Why? Here's how we're going to break the booklet down. 
I haven't seen it done like this before, but for our structure and our purposes, we're going to refer to this, number one, Al-Usul Al-Thalatha, Four Fundamental Principles, that's chapter one. What we finished right now, as of now, that's chapter one. We finished that, which is the four introductory fundamental principles. According, like I said, to Ibn Qasim, that's an independent booklet that his students added on. And according to Al al Khudair, that is actually part of the book. So chapter one is going to be what we just finished right now. The four fundamental principles. That's chapter one. Chapter two is going to start off near exactly like almost close to chapter one. I'alam rahimakallahu ta'ala. That's chapter two, which we are going to study right now. I'alam rah inshallah. I'alam rahimakallah. No, may Allah have mercy. That's chapter two. What chapter two is, the outline of it. Make a framework. You should put it in front of you and write an outline. Chapter two in this book talks about eight, uh, three, three issues. It's called three matters. That's really what it's called. The three matters. The matter number one is Tawheed al Rububiyyah. And in Tawheed al Rububiyyah, there's six subheadings. So number one is going to be A, B, C, D, E, F. Then B, the second matter is, the, uh, number two is matters on Tawheed al Uluhiyyah or Shirk. And number three is going to be something about wala and bara. Those are the three issues. Now chapter three then is a short note on Millet Ibrahim. Talks a little bit about Millet Ibrahim and he says, he starts off, I'lam arshadaka, I'lam arshadaka Allahu ila ta'ate. No, may Allah direct you to obedience. That would be chapter three. Those three chapters are all disputed, whether they were works of uh, uh, whether they were added by the author or his students wanted to add it as an introduction to his book al usul al chapter 4 which starts fa in qila laka mal usul al it starts off fa in qila laka mal usul al if you're asked what are the three fundament what are the three principles uh, they're the matters that you talk about great that's the core of the book so chapter 4 is the core of the book he talks about the three matters you'll be asked about in your grave and at the end of it, he makes a conclusion on Al-Kufr Bil-Taghut and uh, some matters about life after Al-Akhirah. So now you know the structure of the book. We're going to divide it into, four, we're going to call them four chapters. And that will help you understand and visualize what we've been studying. So now, right now, let us start with chapter two. He starts off chapter two saying, no, May Allah have mercy upon you. No, may Allah have mercy upon you. That it's obligatory on every Muslim, female and male, to learn and act upon the following three matters. اعلم رحمك الله أنه يجب على كل مسلم ومسلمة تعلم هذه المسائل الثلاث والعمل بهن. The author says, No, may Allah have mercy on you. That it is obligatory on every Muslim, male and female, to learn and act upon the following three matters. We spoke in the beginning of chapter one on this introduction because that's how he started chapter one. He started chapter two, very similar to how he started chapter three, except that he said Muslim, male and female. He said Muslim and male and female. So we're going to talk about that. Why he said Muslim, why he said male and female. One issue here is that he's, that, let's start off with male and female. Why did he mention Muslim or Muslima? Every Muslim, male and female. Uh, he added female as an assurance because in reality in Arabic, when you address male, and likewise, the Quran came in the eloquent Arabic language, in the peak of the eloquent, eloquency of the Arabic language. So when he says male, it automatically addresses female unless there's proof to exclude them. The only reason he added it here, to add extra assurance, to emphasize that every last individual that I'm talking to you must know this. He said it's obligatory on every Muslim. So why did he say Muslim? Why did he use the active participle, ism al fa'il? In Arabic it's called ism al fa'il. Why did he use that? A Muslim, first of all, is one who says shahadatayn. A Muslim is one who says shahadatayn. You've got to verbally say shahadatayn. If you grew up into Islam, there's no point, no per point like when the person starts talking, he doesn't have to say it to enter Islam. He's already Muslim. However, he's of course taught it because he's on his fitrah. But someone who went into shirk and kufr and disbelief, they have to say to enter 
Islam. So first one is shahadatin. Second one is to act according to the shahada. And that is knowledge, certainty, sincerity, submission, love, truthfulness, compliance, acceptance, the rules that we know for La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. That's the second one. The third one is you don't do any gator to take you out of Islam. You don't do any gator to take you out of Islam. If any one of these three that I mentioned are missing, then the label is taken off. There's one door to Islam, but there's a lot of windows and, and doors to exit you out. Islam is like wudu. You can make wudu right now. However, you can invalidate your wudu. And likewise Islam. That's the term given to one who re renders apostate, rigda. Rigda is one who was a believer, then becomes a non-believer. One who's originally into kufr, his, his name is uh, uh, original non-believer, which is kafir asli. And there's difference in those in the books of fiqh. They're both non-believers, but there's difference in the fiqh books pertaining to the details of each one of them. Here he said, يَجِبُ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ مُسْلِمًا Why did he specify Muslim? Are non-Muslims exempted from this? Are they addressed or are they not exempted? There's no question, there's no question that non-believers are addressed in the matters of principles of Islam. Non-Muslims are addressed in the matters of, matters of principles of Islam. Islam calls and addresses non-believers to Tawheed and they will be held in the Akhirah, they will be held accountable in the Akhirah if they don't accept. The reason the author specifies Muslims here is because this booklet was directed to, to Muslims. Otherwise, Islamically, from our perspective, the Tawheed is addressed to Muslims and non-Muslims. There's no dispute among the ulama in the usul. The principles of Islam are directed. However, are non-believers addressed in secondary matters? Even though it's disputed, some say yes, some say no. I think the summary of it is that the non-believers pertaining to secondary matters are addressed in a way and not addressed in a way. They are addressed in a way and they're not addressed in, in another way. So they're addressed in, first of all, they're addressed in A, a and B. They're addressed in that when a Muslim conveys Islam, there's no problem that he can address them and teach them manners and salah and hajj or any other secondary matters. Maybe it'll open their hearts to Islam through that secondary matter. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ told Mu'adh when he went to Yemen. Among the matters he told them to teach were secondary matters. B is that they're addressed in that they will be punished for not accepting the secondary matters according to the most uh, uh, reputable of two opinions on that issue. So if they don't accept and abide by the secondary matters and do them, they will be punished for them. Because look at the verses in the Quran. مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُسَلِّينَ وَلَمْ نَكُمْ نُطْعِمُ الْمِسْكِينَ وَكُنَّا نَخُوضُ مَعَ الْخَائِضِينَ وَكُنَّا نُكَذِّبُ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينَ what caused you to go hell, to hellfire their ass when they're in hellfire? They say we didn't used to make our salah. We didn't give our zakah. We used to talk falsehood. And we used to be with those vain talkers. Those are secondary matters. Some of those are secondary matters. And to prove that they're non-believers that are being punished for these, they used to say, we disbelieve in the life after. Anyone who disbelieves in the life after is not non-Muslim. So the clear Quran sa says that they're in, punished in Jahannam for matters that are considered, some matters that are considered secondary matters. Now, how we said they're not addressed in a way. How are they not addressed in another way? For example, the details of Islam. You don't require a Muslim to go to Hajj. You don't tell, an, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a non-Muslim. You don't tell a non-Muslim, go to Hajj. Or a non-Muslim, go make your Salah. Because it's not accepted from him. The Shahada, the key to its acceptance is not there. So in that sense, he's not addressed. Okay, the author goes on to say, Al-Ula. 
أن الله خلقنا ورزقنا ولم يتركنا هملا أن الله خلقنا ورزقنا The first matter here is that أن الله خلقنا ورزقنا ولم يتركنا هملا بل أرسل إلينا رسولا فمن أطاعه دخل الجنة ومن عصاه دخل النار والدليل قوله تعالى إنا أرسلنا إليكم رسولا شاهدا عليكم كما أرسلنا إلى فرعون رسولا فعصى فرعون الرسول فأخذناه أخذا وبيلا The first of the matters here is that Allah created us. So in your notes right now, you write 1A that Allah created us. That's the first issue. There's going to be a B, C, D, E, F, inshallah ta'ala. I don't think we'll get past A today. الأولى أن الله خلقنا that Allah created us there's proof on that in the Quran and in the Sunnah and by intellect and there's so much proof and it's so plenty and great and dignified that you literally can go on without exaggeration for months talking about these verses if not more in Surah Ali Umran إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب in the creation Truly, verily, in the creation of the heaven, in the earth, the alternation of the day and the night, the signs, there's, there's signs for men of comprehension or understanding. Allah created you and your handiwork. Allah created you from clay. Then He gave you an appointed time on this earth. Ajala means He gave you appointed time. 20 years you're going to live, 50 years, 2 months, 1 year. That is Ajala. And uh, In Surah Al-A'raf, we created you and fashioned you. In Surah Al-A'raf, when it's talking about uh, human beings. When it's talking more specifically about Adam, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ صَلْصَالٍ مِنْ حَمَاءٍ مَسْنُونٍ We created man, meaning Adam, from dry clay and blackened mud. If you go from the miracles of Allah, when He talks about the His, His signs and miracles, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ إِذَا أَنْتُمْ بَشَرٌ تَنْتَشِرُونَ In Surah Al-Rum, from His signs is that He created you from clay and then you were offspring scattered all over the earth. Surah Al-Rahman خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ صَلْصَالِكَ الْفَخَارِ He created man, Allah created man from dry clay like that of potter. That's صَلْصَالِكَ الْفَخَارِ is potter. Many verses like that in a Zumar when it's about all of creation. Allahu خَالِقُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Allah is the creator of everything. If we can go, we can go really on and on with these verses that are numerous throughout the Quran. This is such a clear matter actually that the arrogant mushrikeen who gave the Prophet ﷺ the hardest of all times and disbelieved in him and physically and mentally abused him and his sahaba tortured him as arrogant as they were and as snobbery and as swanky as they were when it came to this matter they believed in it. In five different verses actually in the Quran, if you look at it, وَلَا إِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ If you ask them about the Creator, in five different verses, they answer Allah. In fact, they went on at one of the answers, in one of the answers, they went out to give the names and qualities of Allah. وَلَا إِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ لَيَقُولُنَّ خَلَقَهُنَّ الْعَزِيزُ الْعَلِيمُ In Surah Al-Zukhraf, if you were to ask them, if you were to ask them, who created the heaven and the earth, they will surely say, لَيَقُولُنَّ خَلَقَهُنَّ Al-Aziz. Al-Aziz is the Almighty. Al-Alim, the All-Knower. So in a, in a sense, they had some belief in Asma and Sifat. These, these, uh, these kind of verses, and this when it sets in your mind, is a Iman booster. When Jubair ibn Mut'ib was apprehended, radiallahu anhu was apprehended in the battle of Badr as a prisoner, Sahih Bukhari. And the Prophet sallallahu made Salat al-Maghrib and recited out loud. And Jubair was among the prisoners, listened to the Prophet sallallahu recite. When the Prophet sallallahu began to recite in Surah Al-Tur, he got to the verses, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْءٍ أَمْ هُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ أَمْ خَلَقُوا السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بَلَّا يُوقِنُونَ Were they created by nothing? 
Or did they create themselves? Did they create the heaven and the earth? They have no certainty. أم خلقوا من غير شيء أم هم الخالقون أم خلقوا السماوات والأرض بل لا يوقنون أم عندهم خزائن ربك أم هم المسيطرون Do they have possession of the treasures of your Lord? جبير بن مطعم رضي الله عنه said When I heard that my heart almost flew and that's when Iman first settled in my heart Those verses of the creator Allah were the seeds that brought Jubair ibn Mut'im from a non-believer fighting the Prophet to a solid companion next to the Prophet Muhammad and Anas ibn Malik. If you want some of that, we'll just mention maybe one hadith. And Anas ibn Malik قال, نهينا أن نسأل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن شيء فكان يعجبنا أن يجي الرجل من أهل البادية العاقل فيسأله ونحن نسمع. The Sahaba in Anas narrates the story Anas ibn Malik says, we were forbidden or deterred from, at a point of time, from asking the Prophet sallallahu That's without genuine need or matters that may cause a one to ask a question which will cause a matter to be prohibited where otherwise it would have been remained halal has, had he not asked. They, so what they loved is they were pleased when a Bedouin from the outskirts would come from the desert and they were pretty, you know, uh, blunt. They would come to the Prophet ﷺ and ask him. So they used to like that. So they can learn from the questions. فَجَاءَ رَجُلٌ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْبَادِيَةِ فَقَالَ يَا مُحَمَّدْ أَتَانَا رَسُولُكَ فَزَعَمَ لَنَا أَنَّكَ تَزْعُمُ أَنَّ اللَّهَ أَرْسَلَكَ قَالَ صَدَقْ So this man is trying to get how he's going to believe in the Prophet ﷺ. Look how he goes about in it. The Bedouin from the dwellers of the outskirts, desert, came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Your messenger, you sent someone to us in our town. And he's asserting that you claim that Allah sent you as a prophet. The Prophet ﷺ said, he spoke the truth, yeah. Look how he went about it. Allah. The Bedouin said, who created the heaven? The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah. Allah. So the Bedouin asked again, who created the earth? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah. Then he went and asked his third question. قَالَ فَمَنْ نَصَبَ هَذِهِ الْجِبَالِ وَجَعَلَ مَا فِيهَا وَجَعَلَ مَا فِيهَا فَقَالَ Allah. So the, the uh, Bedouin asked, who created the mountains and put in the mountains? What's in it? The Prophet Sallallahu said, Allah. And now he comes to the conclusion. He said, فَبِالَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاءَ وَخَلَقَ الْأَرْضَ وَنَصَبَ الْجِبَالَ أَاللَّهُ أَرْسَلَكَ قَالَ نَعَمْ He said by him who created the skies and raised them and created the earth and the mountains and what's in them Allah sent you? He said yes. Look at that conversation between a Bedouin and the Prophet ﷺ. By fitra he knew that Allah is the creator. This was an educated man. This was a man from the outskirts who had, who, when, when he approached the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Muhammad, not even the manners of saying, O Prophet of Allah. So it's something that's firm in the fitrah. In, in Imam Ahmad, when he reflected on this question on the existence of Allah, he gave the example of an egg. He said, it's like a strong little bastion fortress has no doors, no entry point, that's the egg. No holes to get in, sealed, airtight. From the outside it glows like silver. He's talking about the shell of the egg. From inside it shimmers like gold, the yolk part of it. Then suddenly it cracks open, it breaks open. And from that sealed, closed, airtight egg breaks out a creation with eyes it can see with, with ears it can hear with, its appearance is beautiful, it has a nice voice, and it wanders all over the world, meaning it walks, it does everything all over the world. From a sealed egg. A'ilahum ma'allah. Can a creator other than Allah do something like but, but, but Allah? But, uh, can a creator other than Allah do something like that except Allah? Is Shafi'i rahimahullah. When he wanted to reflect on this matter through intellect, he used the leaf of a mulber mulberry tree. The leaf. The leaf is the leaf. And that leaf is consumed by a gazelle, 
by a gazelle, a deer, a sheep, by bees. However, look, when a gazelle consumes it, it gives us musk. You might not know, but the real, real pure musk, the real expensive, the real expensive one comes from a deer. Musk is a gland found only uh, in, in the adult gazelles. And it's, I think, uh, if I recall correctly, it's, uh, it's uh, between the genitals and the umbilicus. And uh, uh, that's the pure, genuine musk. Not the, even if it's a hundred dollar bottle you buy over here that's cold musk, that's not really the real musk. The real musk is the one from the gazelle. The silk, the silk, there's a dudat al in 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 Arabic, silkworm. It consumes the leaf, the same leaf, yet it gives you silk. The bees consume it, yet they produce honey. The sheep and cows consume it, yet they give us milk, yogurt, and the rest of it goes to waste. They're waste. All four examples that I just given you that he told us about, they consume the same leaf. Yet one of them, one of us, one of them produces honey. Another one produces silk. Another one, musk. And another one, meat and milk. If matters are by chance and by coincidence, if matters are ch by chance and coincidence, then the extraction from the same leaf would yield the same result. This is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In al al-Tahawiyyah. العقيدة الطحاوية إمام أبو حنيفة mentions same kind of rationale through intellect. In I recall when Sheikh Safar Al Hawali taught this, he sort of somewhat, in a way, put some doubts in the authenticity of the story because he said these are people challenged Abu Hanifa to a debate on the existence of Allah. He said how could that happen during a time of khilafa? However, I after that I read that it may have been the Qadariya, which are a sect that are extremists in the actions of one, that they uh, give so much control that in a way they resemble atheists and uh, lack of uh, giving power to Allah over everything. Uh, so it could have been the Qadariya, it could have been the phil philosophers that were roaming all over back at that time, the ones who give precedent, not only give precedent, but judge the Quran and the Sunnah by their handicapped minds. Uh, so it could have been any of these because they share common denominators in some matters. So a messenger comes to Abu Hanifa from Ahl Sunnah, crosses the Tigris River, is complaining that there's some philosophers, atheists, Qadariya, whatever they may be, that want a challenge to a debate and they want Abu Hanifa to take on that challenge. So Abu Hanifa says, okay, let them know, I'll be there shortly. He has to cross the Tigris River to get there. The messenger went back happy. He told the people, Abu Hanifa's on his way, he'll be here shortly. Uh, time passed and the messenger got worried. So he would run back and forth to the river and see, is Abu Hanifa there or not, not there? Noon, evening, sundown, night, the atheists, or those who want to debate, began to mock them. Possibly the debater, the one who wants to accept the debate is now backing away or he's standing them up. So the Muslims began to get tense in a way because they knew Abu Hanifa was the Imam, one of the most knowledgeable of their time. And he was a man of his word. And he would fulfill his promise, but they thought that maybe something happened to him which stopped him from attending that event. Late at night, that night, past midnight or so, Abu Hanifa shows up. And the Muslims are there and they ask in concern, what happened to Abu Hanifa? Abu Hanifa rahimahullah says, and here's where it goes. He says, what if I told you that I began my way. And look, when he says, what if I told you that makes it no longer a lie. He said, what if I told you on my way here, got to the Tigris River, got across to get over here. There was no navigator, there's no boat, no sailor, no nothing. Suddenly, suddenly, planks of wood were rising out of the trees. And they're all cut evenly. Same shape, same size. The width, the length is all perfect. Then nails came out of the water. And the boat put itself together. And then some sealant came and sealed the boat. The boat sealed itself by the sealant so no water will go in the holes. Then the boat filled itself by itself with beverages and by people. It filled itself all alone, all this on itself by alone. And it docks alone. 
and it sustains itself alone. The people trying to debate him began to laugh, say impossible. A boat makes itself, positions itself, docks and docks, perfects itself like you're saying in the details of the ceiling, fills itself, loads and unloads, impossible. They began to wonder if this man that they're claiming is the most knowledgeable, the most, the biggest scholar, if he's, you know, being ridiculous or he's a childish type of guy, what's going on here? They couldn't believe that which what he's saying. Abu Hanifa basically said what we would say today, arrest my case. That's all I had to say. If you cannot believe a boat, a ship came into creation by itself, and this is only a boat. How can you believe the whole world, the universe with its sun? with its moon, with its stars and oceans, with its mountains and planets, came into being without a creator. Even without this scenario, tell someone that this palace came into a house, a mansion, a house. This house just came into existence by itself. Just popped up out of nowhere. They're going to call you crazy. But a universe can come into creation by chance. Tawheed al rububiyyah is essential to resist doubts. That's one of the benefits of it. When the shaitan comes with you with doubts, you resist them. It's when you have worries, when worries overwhelm you, when you're surrounded in the darkness of your problems and worries, combined, with, and combined and toppled with the darkness of the nights, contemplate the Creator who you're asking Allah and who will make your worries vanish. Ibrahim ibn Ali, a Sudanese uh, from Sudan, uh, poet, contemporary poet, uh, he uh, gave a very strong uh, poem relating to our topic today. The English flavor may take a little bit out of it, but it's very strongly worded. In the horizon, in the world, in the horizon, there's signs and miracles. It may be that the least of it is that he guided you. Tell the doctor who seized by death, you who cures, who seized you with death? You're supposed to be a doctor. How did you die? Look at the flip side of it. Tell the patient who survived and recovered after medical technology gave up hope. Who is it that cured you? Example, they give him four months and he lives 10 years. Tell the one who's healthy yet dies with no illness. Oh, you healthy one who with death seized you. Tell the one with eyesight who's avoiding pits and stumbling, yet he still stumbles and trips. Who is he who made you stumble and fall? Look at the flip side of it. بَلْ سَائِلِ الْأَعْمَى خُطًا بَيْنَ الزَّحَامِ بِلَا اصْطِدَامٍ مَنْ يَقُودُ خُطَاكَ Ask the one walking in a crowd. He's walking in a crowd. Blind man. Ask the blind man walking in a crowd. Not colliding with anyone. Who is the one who guides you? قُلْ لِلْجَنِينِ قُلْ لِلْجَنِينِ يَعِيشُ مَعْزُولًا بِلَا رَاعٍ وَمَرْعَى مَا الَّذِي يَرْعَاكَ Tell the one, the infant, the newborn. Tell the infant who lives in isolation, no shepherd, no caretaker. Who is he who nourishes you? قل للوليد قل للوليد بكى وأجهش بالبكاء لدى الولادة ما الذي أبكاك? Tell the newborn who bursts out of his mother's womb crying at birth. What made you cry? وَإِذَا تَرَى الثُّعْبَانَ وَإِذَا تَرَى الثُّعْبَانَ يَنْفُثُ سُمَّهُ فَاسْأَلْهُ مَنْ ذَا بِالسُّمُومِ حَشَاكَ If you see a snake that spools, it spools its venom, ask that snake who with toxins stuffed you. 
the toxins in the snake mouth is poison to me. وإذا ترى الثعبان ينفث سمه فاسأله من ذا بالسموم حشاك واسأله يا واسأله واسأله كيف تعيش يا ثعبان أو تحيا وهذا السم يملأ فاك. Ask the snake. Ask him. How do you survive, O oh snake? You live while the toxic poison fills your mouth. واسأل بطون النحل كيف تقاطرت. واسأل بطون النحل كيف تقاطرت شهدا وقل للشهد من حلاك Ask the bee's stomachs how honey oozes out of it and then tell the honey who sweetens you بل سائل بل سائل اللبن المصفى كان بين دم وفرث ما الذي صفاك Ask the pure milk that white, nice, clean, purified milk that comes to you, as that pure milk that was between excretions and blood, what purified you? He took that from the verse of Allah. وَإِنَّ لَكُمْ فِي الْأَنْعَامِ لَعِبْرَةً نُسْقِيكُمْ مِمَّا فِي بُطُونِهِ مِنْ بَيْنِ فَرْثٍ وَدَمٍ لَبَنًا خَالِصًا سَائِغًا للشاربين. means the same thing as this line uh, of poem. Then he went on to say, uh, Tell the air, tell the air, that's felt on hands, yet hidden from eyes. Who is it that hid you? قل النباتي. قل للنباتي يجف بعد تعهد ورعاية من بالجفاف رماك Tell the plant that dries even after you maintain and care for it Who with dryness strikes you? وإذا رأيت وإذا رأيت النبت في الصحراء يربو وحده فاسأله من أرباك If you see If you see in the desert if you see a plant in the desert growing without maintenance, ask it, who is it that nourishes you? Several weeks ago, let me explain this line a little bit more. Plant you see in the desert, and it's growing without no one maintaining it in a vast desert. Who nourishes it? Several weeks ago, we were, uh, uh, I was in another state, and the brothers took us on some architectural cruise in a boat, in a ship. It was late and it was cold and we were the only ones on that cruise. It was very late and no one was there. So we were on that cruise and they showed us landmarks, modern architecture from the water, you know, some of man-made creation. The cruise goes on for approximately an hour while the guide speaks and explains each building and some amazing details of it. Uh, the, the one thing that really, really got my attention is that all these buildings and some were designed like this and some were designed like features that are really amazing. When we got to a point at a little tree, the guy said, everyone look at that tree. And he made it a point to tell everyone and draw their attention to look at that tree. He said, for the past 13 years, I've been working as a guide here. The one thing I couldn't understand is how that tree grows out of a cement block. How? I've been trying to figure that out for 13 years. It's unexplainable. It's un he can explain all those buildings and architecture, but subhanAllah, Allah made him speak about that little tree that's growing out of the cement. That's what, it, what that line means. وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَ النَّبْتَ فِي الصَّحْرَاءِ يَرْبُوا وَحْدَهُ فَاسْأَلْهُ مَنْ أَرْبَاكَ This is why we study this aqeedah to charge and ignite our Iman to the summit. Aqeedah is meant to charge, resist doubts. When you resist doubts, you take it to a higher level. When you resist doubts and, you raise, and, and your Iman is, hits the summit, when you raise your hands truly, you believe you're speaking to a Rabb, to a Lord, to Allah, and not to the four walls in your bedroom. When you go over this so much and you resist all the doubts and you learn the pure white Tawheed, your Iman reaches the level of, uh, your, your, your Tawheed reaches the level of Iman. Then it goes on further to reach the level which we're targeting of Ihsan. 
Then when you raise your hands to Allah, you feel different knowing He who can make that plant dry, grow in a dry, massive desert or out of the cement can make the impossible possible happen for you. Hadi, hadi ajaibu talama ukhidat biha aynaka wanfatahat biha udhunaka These are wonders and miracles that startle your eyes and open your ears. وَلَعَلَّ مَا فِي النَّفْسِ مِنْ آيَاتِهِ عَجَبٌ عُجَابٌ لَوْ تَرَ عَيْنَاكَ Look at that line. وَلَعَلَّ مَا فِي النَّفْسِ مِنْ آيَاتِهِ عَجَبٌ عُجَابٌ لَوْ تَرَ عَيْنَاكَ Perhaps in your own self, perhaps in your own self are the most wondrous signs if your eyes can see. That's the verse. وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبْصِرُونَ وفي أنفسكم أفلا تبصرون والكون والكون مشحون بأسرار إذا حاولت تفسيرا لها أعياك The universe is full The universe is charged full of unexplainable secrets If you attempt to interpret them you're only going to frustrate yourself Attempting to interpret, it, interpret some of Allah's creation will bring you to frustration. Look at the end of the towards the end of the poem. It boosts the, the poet's iman where he's saying, he's saying that I only care, oh Allah, about what if you're pleased about me. Ya ayyuhal insanu. يا أيها الإنسان مهلا من ذا الذي بالله جل جلاله أغراك Oh you man who, uh, who has made you careless about your Lord the most generous تبارك الله أحسن الخالق أحسن الخالقين Blessed be Allah the best of all creators the More beautiful than this poetry If we really contemplate and comprehend أمن خلق السماوات والأرض وأنزل لكم من السماء ما فأنبتنا به حدائق ذات بهجة ما كان لكم أن تنبتوا شجرة أيله مع الله بل هم قوم يعدلون أمن جعل الأرض قرارا وجعل خلالها أنهارا وجعل لها رواسيا وجعل بين البحرين حاجزا أيله مع الله بل أكثرهم لا يعلمون أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء ويجعلكم خلفاء الأرض أيله مع الله قليلا ما تذكرون Once a Bedouin was asked how do you know Allah exists? Unsophisticated. Unsophisticated man who lives in the desert. But his fitrah is pure. Look what he said. Camel dung indicates there was a camel here. Camel dung indicates camel. Donkey dung indicates donkey. Footprints indicate travel. So the sky, the sky with all its constellations, with the seas, and its ways, all that do not that does not that indicate the all knowing, the all powerful in, in Arabic. Al Ba'aratu Tadullu ala al Ba'ir. Al Ba'aratu Tadullu ala al Ba'ir. Wa Rawthu Yadullu ala al Hamir. Wa Atharu al Akadami Tadullu ala al Masir. Sama on that to Abraj. Wa Ardun that to Sama on that to Abraj. وبحار ذات أمواج أما يدل ذلك على العليم القدير and inshallah this concludes uh, uh, chapter one of uh, 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 section one of chapter one uh, chapter two we started on chapter two this is one a inshallah next week we will do b c d e f or whatever we get a chance to do inshallah ta'ala jazakumullahu khair